Today, I'm delighted, delighted to introduce Nick Bonner, the founder of Corio Tours, the tour company that specializes in tours to the DPRK or North Korea. Nick is also the owner of one of the largest collections of North Korean art outside of North Korea. Uh, and in a moment, he's going to give us an extensive guide to the various styles of art, um, graphic design, and propaganda that comes out of the state. And in doing so, I hope it's going to give everyone a, a better idea, a better understanding of what it's like to live and work in North Korea. Nick, welcome to Political Tours. Welcome to Beyond the Headlines. Thank you very much. Lovely. So, um, Nick, but before we, I mean, we've got a, a fantastic sort of body of work to look at, um, but the very first question I'd like to know is that how, how did you end up to really sort of you know, dedicate your career to, to spending all this time in, in North Korea? How did you first come to be there? Yeah, it wasn't planned. I, I ended up uh, basically seeing a friend of mine, Josh Green, in uh, China, and he was working uh, for setting up DHL, the, the courier company in North Korea. They'd been there a year. And a, a Korean friend of his had approached him and saying, look, we, we've opened up to foreign tourism in 1987. Before that, it was really just to non-aligned countries. And they said, look, we, but no one's coming. So we've got a whole country and, and very few people. So Josh and I got together and uh, Corio Tours was set up um, by Josh initially and I joined him. And since then we've been uh, get going strong. I mean, there's been ups and downs. This is at the present time is an interesting time. North Korea was the first country to close with the virus and remains closed and probably will be the last to reopen. But the adventure continues. Yeah. So I know that people are going to have um, you know, d dozens, dozens and dozens of questions. And with that in mind, um, if everyone looks at the bottom of their screen, you'll see various boxes. And there's some, there are two, um, there's a, a, a box called Q&A, funnily enough, and click on Q&A. And then if you've got any questions, do write, put your questions in there. Um, and then we may ask them as we go along, or we may ask them after we've had this um, look at the various slides that um, Nick has, has got here. Um, and also we may come to you and unmute your microphone. Don't worry, we'll give you some advance warning um, so you, you, um, you know when it's going to come on. So that, that's that Q&A box at the bottom there if you've got any questions. Well, let, let, let's, do, let's start looking at some of the art that you've, you've got. Um, here's here's um, our introductory slide. Um, you 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 take it away here because we're we're looking okay. we're going to look at three things here, aren't we? We're going to look at three rough three. Yeah, I, I thought what we'd do is we would look at basically sort of the, the sort of art and and film, um, the sort of two mediums of how North Korea used them, and they obviously use them for propaganda purposes. There is no such thing in North Korea as art for art's sake, and that's actually a written tenet there. Um, and I'm going to take you through that and then show how we have worked um, with the sort of Korea Studio, which is something we set up sort of to do cultural engagement with North Korea, um, how we work with artists and filmmakers um, to sort of get away, if you like, from this, this uh, very strict um, art and film um, media. So give you an idea of what, what it's like on the streets. The sort of next slide is of uh, an American being crushed, basically saying we will have it out with whoever, whoever sort of damages our pride. And this is very typical ebbs and flows the sort of propaganda messages they can be political they can be militaristic i'll take you through some other pieces this one is particularly anti-american it's around 2005 uh, with with bush uh, and iraq going on um in fact the following slide is probably similar a year later here we see a um an american uh, soldier and a japanese soldier being run through with a bayonet saying you know our enemies uh, must not stop reunification. So you're getting the idea that on the street, everywhere you're being bombarded with, with, with political slogans. Everything is told to you from above. Um, if we move on, uh, it's not just political uh, bits and pieces. It's also, this is a, a piece for sort of, let's move and, uh, forward with the new factory. This is a new, um, uh, a factory that makes um, what you call liner cuts, line linoleum. So it's an instruction from above. And it, it was interesting recently we were in with uh, with Palin, it, it, American 
propaganda comes and goes. Michael Payton, did, Payton, yeah, Michael Payton, yeah. we just took him on a documentary and at that time, everything was sort of going quite well. It was where Moon, Moon Jae-in and, and uh, Kim Jong-un sort of met. And so immediately they didn't, they wanted to play down the propaganda role. So suddenly the anti-American propaganda was taken down from the streets and replaced with slight, you know, images such as this, like let's build a strong country, let's work towards reunification. And as, as we were filming, we had Palin writing out a, a, a card to one of his Monty Python mates. And he said, okay, we'll go to the rehearsal, let's get a card. And as soon as we turned around to get one of the propaganda cards with anti-American imperialists, they'd gone. The lady had stuffed them down their top and sort of wandered off. So uh, anything bumps, uh, bumps and things go on in North Korea. Um, the next slide is perhaps even showing that control, this is in the, 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 the passageway of a housing unit. Um, so propaganda can also be, you know, social control as we have it, um, you know, keep cleanliness. Uh, this one's obviously turned off the electricity with a sort of rather sort of sad looking child and family. Um, but it's everywhere, the, 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 everywhere you go, whether it be through the architecture, through the slogans, through the propaganda, through the sculptures, you are being immersed uh, as an individual by the state. Um, the next slide here, I think is probably the best way. Here you have the triumvirate, uh, the best way of showing this. This is the, the Workers' Party is represented by not only the, the, uh, the farm worker, that's the girl on the right, and, and the industrial worker, the man in the middle, but it also embraces the intellectual and that's the calligraphy brush that is put in there. And here we see the people uh, in the metro coming out, you know, delivered, but very clearly under the, the domination of, of, of the state. And that is how art performs. It, 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 it's uh, art in North Korea, it's totally embodied there to make sure you follow the system. Um, and, and that is its purpose. It's it's the thing yeah. that really strikes me about all these slides here so far, and, and also just traveling to North Korea, it really, it, both in terms of the art and um, the buildings and walking around, it does feel as though you are stuck in the late, fifth, late 40s or early 50s. Uh, it is that the, the genre doesn't seem to have moved beyond that. Yeah, the, the biggest changes really were in, in sort of 2002, there's an economic change. Um, and so the actual fabric of almost literally the fabric of what people were wearing, fashion came in, stuff was coming in from China, um, there was market, our markets had opened and that was a change. But if, if you had a map of Pyongyang, that, you know, the one I had in 93, it would serve you very well today. Um, there's three new streets that have been built uh, since sort of basically since the celebration of Kim Il-sung's death, um, the 100th anniversary, that was a sort of big, big sort of um, target to sort of start re reopening the city and Kim Jong-un has put in sort of various playgrounds etc but it's it's the same it's more of the same so uh, and specifically, same, looking at, specifically looking at the art that socialist realism that's been consistent throughout the DPRK's history. They haven't veered away from that at all. Socialist realism, it, it, it's changed in the respect that, that there are different techniques, but it is still socialist realism. It is still the, uh, an image of an individual, you know, as if 100,000 volts of electricity are running through them, that sort of forced smile. Interestingly enough, it, there are moments in everyone's life, and I went with my partner, we went um, olive picking, and there are moments within a day's work where you actually do smile like, a, you know, well, hey, the work's over. So it's not that it's such a lie, it's just that that is the only expression they have, that this we're building towards a bright future. The, 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 the image here is, you know, of the, the triumvirate, if you like, but of course, above these three people in power, above the Workers' Party, in the next slide, are, are of course the leaders and this is Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il here. Um, this is a painting and with its, you can see this sort of overhang protecting it. Um, and it's, it's of a sort of, a, you know, a bountiful sort of rice harvest. The next picture, similar, but in mosaic. Mosaic is sort of used as a more permanent way of, of, uh, of keeping these, um, these artworks protected. And this is another bountiful harvest. Um, it's a way North Korea uses socialist, it is the only form of art. There is no other form of expression allowed. There is landscape painting, um, but there's no uh, avant-garde, there's, 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 no, there's certainly no 
um, Pollock, Jackson Pollock or anything like that. Abstract is not allowed. And the artwork is used to reinforce the propaganda posters, the same sort of message. So if we go to the next one, this is a historical piece. It's to almost visually remind people, remind Koreans that this is their history, that the history of the revolution, it starts here. It starts with the guerrillas. Uh, this is joint occupation of by Japan of, of the Korean Peninsula from 1910 to 45. And this is the guerrillas under, of course, the leadership of Kim Il-sung, um, bravely fighting up in the north, up in Pekdu. They eventually were sort of fought, forced out in sort of, I think, 41, up to Russia, but then re-entered um, the country. Um, and the azalea, when they re-entered, there was the azalea uh, sort of was blooming. And so the azalea becomes a part of that history. And in fact, in North Korean art, not only do you get the azalea, you also get the Kim jong il um, which is a, a begonia, and you get the Kim Il-sung, an orchid. There's various ways they use of referencing the leadership throughout. Um, the next picture is of, of, uh, of the Korean War. And this is, uh, this is 50 to 53, when the division of the country was firmly in place. Uh, and here we see a school teacher um, returning um, with a band playing from, from the Korean War. And again, re-emphasizing you know, the victory. Uh, the, the war museum they have is the victorious Fatherland Liberation War Museum. Very clearly, uh, they, 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 know, they know we cite one. Um, right up to the next slide, which is more current. This is this, the, the guard post, snow on the guard post at Tabak School on the way uh, to the east, to the west coast, sorry. And instead of pine trees, you know, growing up, it's a sort of a bit of akak uh, guns. Um, I believe that Nick, you had a, you had a run in in this I area. Had, I don't know if there's some, um, any of others will remember this, but um, we stopped traveling, unfortunately, to North Korea some time ago. Um, and on one occasion we went to uh, a collective farm on the way to Nampo, so that's a, a similar area, and um, there was this great big tunnel underneath a mountain which sort of doubled up as I think as some kind of aircraft anti um, um, sort of bombing shelter, uh, and then we walked down to the fields, to the paddy fields, and um, somebody noticed these things pointing out of camouflage nets on top of the hill, and there was great excitement among our party. Um, I don't know whether Dylan Thwaites is listening in, um, but <laughs> we took, we also lined up to have a photograph because the only thing we, when we were going to get a photograph this was to have a group photograph with the guns poking at the mountain behind us. And they quickly sussed out what we were, what we were doing and moved us on. <laughs> Dylan Thwaites is the reality, there. It was reality. The point was you could actually see the guns, you know, it's just, it, it, was, right. um, it was there. Dylan Thwaites, I hope, did return after that that photographic foray. Uh, yeah, he he did, he did. Yeah. He did. He did. He did his best to get arrested, but he didn't. It is. It is. I mean, it is a fascinating place to visit. As, you know, it was opened in eighty seven, but to Western tourists, there's still under two thousand people visiting a year. So it's like sort of Bogner on a wet Wednesday, uh, and, and you are shepherded around, but. Like as if you know, you're like you would put your grandparents on a, a sort of a, a bus tour. You go and visit this monument and etc. It, it is a. It's, well, I mean, we'll come up to the sort of probably the, you know, the, the sort of policy. Should you visit this country or should you not? But uh, you, most people who go come back with certainly more questions than they, they've 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 ever dreamt they would. Um, and you're certainly going to learn more about North Korea by actually being there. It, it is a fascinating place, and you, this. What you do get is you also feel what it's like, this sense of being bombarded by this propaganda. And, and that really hits you if you've only been once. The second time you go, you actually it sort of sort of sinks in. And it's a little bit like when you come down your lift, if you live in an apartment block and there's a, there's a notice saying, keep the area clean. You eventually, my North Korean friends, you know, they see propaganda posters, but they don't have the impact that they did have when they were young. It becomes part of the sort of the surroundings, if you like. And have back to the art. So this is this is a this is basically Kim Kim Jong Il coming up with this this policy, the the army first, uh, the Songun policy, um, and that represented during this sort of period, the arduous march, this period of uh, starvation and uh, economic collapse in North Korea. This this very sort of tough time, but basically all the goods put towards the army, and we're, we're facing a very tough time again uh, with the country being closed. But more on that later. Um, imagery wise, if we go to the next one, it's a lovely old woman there with a People's Hero Medal, Workers' Hero Medal. Um, 
and here she is. This is again to sort of imbue on the on the North Korean set. You should sort of follow through uh, supporting the state with 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 your life, with all your your. These are heroes. This is your hero. It's not a sort of football player earning X million quid. It's an old woman who's basically driven a lorry there. And you see the five. This is for fifty thousand kilometers. Each star that is given for every fifty thousand kilometers without an accident. So that is your, you know, that is what you are meant to be sort of as a child looking up to. Um, of course, the problem with this artwork is it is sort of these allegorical themes, storytelling little themes that get rather repetitive. And the next slide is sort of almost similar, but with a with a with a, a, an old bloke there and a, a young what in China they call a red card, but here it's a young pioneer. Um, so I am in a, a school children's union. Um, girl sort of you know saying great you know carry on where you know we, you're doing a wonderful job um, and the next slide again you know almost like that that first one with the, the factory for the uh, lino cuts you know do a good job here's a female crane driver it's nice to see that the female women are represented in, in some form there is some form of uh, understanding and knowledge that women have a place in society uh, the reality of course it's a little bit like i'm afraid south korea where uh, you know coming from confucian roots um it, it does tend to be rather male orientated um have the next slide have you ever seen hidden meaning that might be um d d um and have any sort of critical or sort of independent view from the regime creep through if you look at um rose clark was just asking this question now if you look at some Soviet propaganda and art at the time, though you and even in Moscow, you'll find um, statues or works of art that have a sort of um, a, a message that is could be seen as critical of the regime. Yeah, uh, yeah, Moscow said in film, uh, definitely in North Korea, no, and in China, a pretty similar situation. In China, there was this group going, uh, called the a group of watercolors going around, um. Uh, called the black, it's black, sort of black, it's called black art, um, the no name artists, and they were they were seen as extremely you, you know against the revolution, but all they were doing was basically pretty picture painting, um, but that was seen as wrong, and it wasn't until late eighties really that Mao in any way was treated with perhaps you know not the not the, the, the what the system required. Um, uh, so in North Korea, no, there was there was a great story that. Uh, that was put out, I think, in early 2000s. That the a, a portrait of Kim Jong Il had gone missing, and everybody said, "Oh, there's this change." It was put out by an embassy. I won't mention who. Um, and then the reports started coming. Yes, we've seen that there is slogans being written, uh, graffiti is being written on the metro, and it's true. There is, you know, so both these things are true. The fact is that the, the painting had been taken down to be you know repainted and put back up as they do very often and the and the, the sort of etchings on the uh, on the on the metro were from the west german carriage stock you know and they're all in german so unless it was a north there is there is nothing i've not seen a a, a little a chink in the in the armor people um do not express themselves in any, any way there isn't this sort of anti anti system going on as far as i'm aware whether that, and perhaps to sort of that doesn't mean that people can't think for themselves yeah but expressing it is a very different thing in korea you would you would you would definitely uh, people will answer to a, a degree on, on on their personal feelings but as soon as it you know how did they meet their boyfriend how did they you know what does their mother think of their career etc but as soon as you go into a political question you are going to get a very one sided you know argument and that is it and that they're not going to breach away from that yeah i mean i the question that people always ask me was, you know, um, you know, are, when you see the people sort of waving the flags on the on the parades and when they were crying at the the mm. death of um, um, Kim Jong Il, you know, was that genuine? And I'm, I'm, my answer was by and large, you know, yes. And you sort of have to lit, think of um, sort of imagine medieval Europe, and there are two things that are important to your existence, and one is your belief in God, and the second thing. Is your loyalty to your sort of feudal overlord, and those two things are interwoven within North Korea. Why would you do anything to um, basically get yourself into very, very serious trouble? And, and you know, your way to get ahead is to you, you believe in the system, and by and large, most people do. I think that some of that has been changing in recent years. 
um, and we're not going we're not here to discuss that now in terms of defectors um, and I, I think there's been a great influence of the market economy in certainly in North Korea and there's some, been some changes with that and later on in this season of, of webinars that we're doing we'll look at some of those changes um, yeah I think I, it's, it's fascinating I mean the I, I would say and I'm sure the question you know should, are we morally doing the right thing taking people into North Korea etc we'll come on to that one later but again there's you know the lack of information for North Koreans to 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 see what else is going on on the outside is very difficult nowadays the last few years has been a sort of Sunday a sort of um, Fox News style this is the world news and if you watch that you'd be bloody pleased that you're living in North Korea you know no droughts no sort of things you, you what see what you see wars going on on the outside so the lack of information is is something very strong on on, on, a, on a note like that I was watching and I was invited to go to an anti-American parade on Kimmelsong Square, not the sort of thing I would really, you know, it's quite you know, morally you think, well, I'm not anti-American, but I want to see a parade. So I went on in a rather loud shirt and found myself as the only person there in front of tens of thousands of people filling the square. And, and, and it was an anti-American parade. There they were with these posters that you saw earlier on, walking through, all shouting, man say, man say, you know, that's a thousand years life, 10,000 years life. Uh, down with the Americans, but it was choreographed. It wasn't this sort of what we, we what, what I grew up with, the sort of you know the Iranian flag, the American flag being ripped to pieces. It was very orchestrated, very. And when you were there, you know there was no fit after that that parade. People going, oh, got to go pick up my daughter, or did you see the girls second on the left in the you know in the parade? So I think that's a very important thing. It's not that it's staged, but it, it is certainly choreographed a lot of it. Moving on, um, the, 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 um, I, so sorry, I'll go back to that last picture. So here, here we see a sort of a lovely little scene. Um, this is the May Day Stadium on Rangatta Island. And uh, the artist is orientated. So you can see sort of uh, to the right hand side along the river, you see the Jucha Tower. So he's obviously orientated the picture to take in the Jucha philosophy, this philosophy that, that you know, a, a one-hearted unity, il, il Dan Kong, one-hearted unity, man is master of his destiny. This is basically this form of independence that North Korea has. The only way it will survive is by being independent. And uh, it's but the little scenario, that the sort of Confucian scenario, very often there's an elder man looking at the younger man. In this case, you've got the rather sort of hot chick behind in the red, in the red sort of scarf, looking at the, 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 the welder everything sort of fits a sort of scene that, you know, this is what you want to be part of. And for the youth to look at this, this idea is it impresses on the youth. These are shock workers. These are kids coming out of university or after school to come and volunteer on projects. And this is what this sort of artwork is for, this joy of, of achievement of, of us working together in solidarity. Um, the next scene is again of a shock brigade. This is building the Nampo Highway. This is a road that goes from Pyongyang out, out to Nampo, and it was all built by hand, which you sort of tend to feel if you've ever driven that highway. Um, and here, here you see a woman uh, beating a man, or obviously about to beat a man in an arm wrestle. And lots of little sort of vignettes around the accordion with the, the book of new songs on top of it, to the sort of left-hand side of the picture. And the men, you know, sort of, the, 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 sort of supporting their teammate, whether she be, and she's the girl in this, in this case. So it's chocolate box sort of um, art. It's, it's sort of, I think the word, uh, it, it's, it was develop our national form and socialist in content. So it's a North Korea, North Korea style, but with a definitely socialist message. And continuing on the next slide, you know, the joys, the, the, the valor of labor, the joys of sort of, you know, filling up your lorry of, of, of the, the poor worker that but you are part of the system. You have not gone unnoticed. No matter how menial your task, you deserve to have a painting. In the West, we've stopped this sort of form of painting since sort of almost the sort of 19th century. We, we, we don't sort of express the sort of the, the valor of labor, if you like. Um, the, the next picture, to all purposes, you know, people say, well, there is art, this is a landscape, isn't it pretty? Therefore, there is sort of a form of fine art. And, and there is, there's a, a Chosun Hua, which is a Korean style art of big uh, brush ink paintings that, that is very unique and is of landscapes. But this landscape, 
it is actually the bucolic landscape of saying, look, we are a great country. We are independent. We, you can see you know, actually quite how desperate it is with the terraces right going in the back so that they are growing in, in areas really, really where they shouldn't be growing crops. But we are carrying on. We, we, we're a mountainous country. We're independent and, and we're strong. So uh, the final one, I suppose, on, on this scene, we're nearly coming to an end on the, on the images here, is of a... You know, there is propaganda everywhere. Even even a snowman will be carrying the Unhua three uh, uh, sort of rocket. Um, nothing nothing goes away. The only painting I've seen is that, that is actually totally without propaganda was in Joe Dresnock's house, this American defector's house, and it's his Korean's wife's picture. It's the next one. I I, I have yet to find any propaganda um, motive in that one, uh, unless the ball is the world with the, the dog riding over it. Um, so that's that. So if, if that gives you an idea of basically, you are, it is, there is no art for art's sake. Everything is political. So what, what, what I wanted to do was sort of to, to, to work with artists and, and actually see, you know, is this the case? You know, they're obviously very talented people, but is it just churning out this work? And so I'm going to take you very quickly through two pieces uh, that I've, I've done. We've done several ones. Um, <laughs> this is a line of good artist. Just before you um, go, into, um, Nick, just, just how many, give people an idea of how often you are in North Korea, how much of your year is spent there? Um, yeah, I'm, I, uh, um, recently, sort of less, I mean, the last time I was in North Korea, was actually able to get to North Korea, it was November, but we have caught, uh, we're now a sort of team of 10 people, so we're in every month. And since 93, most months, I would be in North Korea. Depending on length of time, if we're making a film, you know, you could be there for two months. If you're leading a tour, you're there for a week and sometimes shorter. But it, I think it's just, yeah, over this sort of, over quite a long period since 93. At what point do you think that people started to trust you? I mean, you've got a, an enormous range of contacts from people mm. making films, art studios, to people who are in, you know, basically in the tourism industry. Um, how, how long did it take, you know, obviously to start off um, a travel company and you needed to build up trust, but can you just tell me a bit more about your personal relationships and how that has built up over yeah. time? I, I think, you know, the trust lasts until, and you see this, you see other people have been in North Korea, trust lasts until you make a mistake and, and the mistake will be something that will normally with, with the leaders or what have you. So when you're doing art and doing film that are so sensitive, you, 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 you are walking a tightrope. You're walking a tightrope that you could offend the North Koreans and you're walking a tightrope that you, you will be seen as a fellow traveler to the outside world. Um, so so it, it, it's, it's, it's basically seeing what you can get away with rather than building up trust. Where, where trust has really come in important is when we were making the documentaries, we made the first film on the football team in 2002 with Daniel Gordon, the director. And he and I went on to make three documentaries. The first one on this football team who in 1966 created the greatest shock in World Cup history. They came as minnows, uh, 2001 outsiders, and they, they beat the Italians. It was an, an amazing story. It's a lovely film. It's, it's available on the internet. The um, and yeah, the game of their lives. And then we then made a second film, um, which was much more sort of following, was following the life of two gymnasts. And, the producer that we work with, who is the, the lady who will come into in, in a bit later, she helped us get access and, and she said, look, not only will we let you film the, the mass games, this uh, 100,000 people in a stadium, choreographed, spectacular, but we'll get you access to the family, to their life. And so we got access. And when this film was made, we, we went back, it was always a review and you, you think, you know, should I have bought a return ticket? Maybe, maybe I won't be able to use it. And you sit in this big room with these carders and they say, this film was not as good as your last film. And you think, oh God, yeah. it was very dark. And in fact, what they meant was it was it's been raining a lot. So that was the first thing. And then they criticized us by saying, this film is not as exciting as the last one. It's very boring. It's like real life. And you just think, fat. Fantastic, got it. So it's a question of sort of, yeah, it is trust. I, mean, I have implicit trust from the artists and people I work with, but you are pushing lines. So, you know, they, they and you are aware of it. It's not me doing the pushing, they are doing the pushing. It was, you know, our producer who got us access to these people. It was this artist who has allowed us to experiment more. They sort of have a feeling and between the two of us, we sort of, so where we are you here? For crazy Where's this photograph here? Where's this taken? 
So this is this is Man State Art Studio, and th th this is one of the artists we worked on. Um, the, the 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 next picture is, is of a, 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 a similar artist, Kim Kwan Nam. Uh, this isn't him in this portrait, but this is Lino Cut. And if I go to the next slide, it was this sort of dialogue that you know people ask: Are these people? You know, can you relate to these people? And I think the reason I put this section in this is a a, a, sci a science fiction comic book, and. He, it was just on his desk and I said oh you know I used to read things like this when I was a kid and he said oh I did as well and we started sort of doodling the pictures that we drew together uh, of, of space and uh, if you look at the next picture you know that that is if you were brought up in the 60s that's you know that's the same sort of images you would you, you know we had at home the storyline for them was of course of the great socialist groups going off together in, in cooperation and in fact there's a lovely story where they have to rescue um uh, uh, you know the the, the uh, imperialists are going off independently, but whereas they do it socially, and so they go off to socially conquer space and the underwater. So we came up with a project where we would. And the next slide is where we drew together um, our images. And uh, here's a much better. I, I was trained in landscape architecture, so I'm, I'm fairly gifted with a with a pen. But this is him working it up. Our idea, um, which is then turned to a liner cut. So it was very different, very refreshing to see that, you know, just as just sharing our sort of, you know, uh, sort of moments of just being young and dreams. Um, and if we carry on the next slide, it, it gets even more complicated. This one is of a, you know, an environmental cleaner. There was a, we made a film on an environmental film with an Australian called uh, Aim High in Creation. And she went to the directors. She was going to learn propaganda filmmaking techniques from North Koreans. And she went to the North Korean director and said, have you heard about the global warming? And then just sort of in shock, just we got it recorded. He says, does she think we're from the moon? And it's this sort of, you know, there are, there are great parallels. We, we do have, uh, if you take away the politics, of course, you know, we're the same. And, and, and in a creative way, of course, there is creative. Um, this is sort of a comic style. The next picture, you know, I mean, it's quite fun and, and very simple. But the one after that, the following one, is a sort of little bit more drama. So I, I quite like the, you know, the way that you, as you develop this sort of this series, we, we sort of, you know, develop the storylines for these lino cuts. Um, on the more serious project, the next one is, this is for the Asia Pacific Triennial for the first time ever. Uh, this is a, an artist in his studio. The pencil work on the right, is the piece that he's drawn up that we selected from a sketch. We sent them all out to this steelworks factory. It was, we were looking at a steelworks factory and it was for this very big exhibition uh, that happens in Australia where they invite art from Asia. And the, the next picture is him drawing that one up. They trace through one to the other bits of paper. Um, this is, uh, the, the thing with this art is we were working away from socialist realism and we were going to social realism. and. This is very important. When artists do their first sketches, it's, it's real life. It's not this sort of, you know, the vitriolic, wow, isn't life 100 brilliant? It's the actual reality. And this, the artist had this piece from a photograph and he said, how am I meant to get this character from a photograph? And so he had to go meet him and get to understand him. The same sort of language you would have if you were speaking to any artist anywhere. Um, this is Imhyok here, the next picture. The art, the painting still isn't finished, but you're getting this idea of this very powerful piece of work, this Korean ink work, Cho Sun Hwa. But for the first time ever, this is artwork that is not socialist realism. This is artwork of this guy is addressing you, looking at you and saying, you know, are you worthy of me, this, 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 this worker at the steelworks? Um, the next picture is of the group of artists as we, the finished work, and we're about to head off to Australia, but sadly, um, you know, this time it was the Australian government who refused their visas. So that whole project that had taken sort of two years and had a great body of work, the artwork got there, but the artists didn't. And so then the artists didn't return to North Korea with that work to say, look, this is a style that, you know, has been appreciated world over. It came back with this idea that it's been a disgrace because Australia refused to accept. Um, Did you manage to get it anywhere else? 
No, uh, the, the, the work is still on show. I mean, I mean we, uh, it's on long-term loan there, and they, the, the uh, Queensland Art Gallery bought some pieces. But we, we do do a lot of exhibitions. But that work, no, it's so massive that it's been left there. And, it's, yeah, it's on regular, you know, every two or three years, a piece will come out in conjunction with a, an exhibition they have. Um, but these artists... Talk a bit more about the studio itself, because that's the Mansa Day Art Studio. Yeah, and in fact, we're looking at a, a young picture of Che Chang Ho. So the guy, um, sort of uh, uh, second from the right, one of the most talented artists ever. And this is an interesting story, because Mansa Day Art, is, art Studio, 4,000 uh, people, of which 1,000 are artists, and there are sort of 3,000 uh, technical and artisans helping. Um, this studio is now illegal to buy art from, it's under sanctions. Um, in fact, the reason why they weren't allowed to go, uh, the Australian government um, wrote, uh, it's it sort of piece was saying that we do not uh, allow pieces from this studio because they produce propaganda art. Well, hey, you know, every studio in North Korea, Korea produces propaganda art. The fact was that this was the first time they'd not produced propaganda art, which was so annoying. But um, anyway, back to this artist, Che Chang Ho. He, he is from up in the north, up at Sinaju. And he's, it is difficult. In North Korea, if you're in Pyongyang, you're a privileged citizen. And the further out you go, likely the less privileged. But he, on, on, on behalf of his merit, moved from Sinaju, right up in the, 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 the north, on the, on the border with China. Uh, he has this most incredible uh, talent in sketching. And he was sort of moved... Uh, to Pyongyang simply on the merit of, of, of his work. And I, uh, you hear stories of this I, I, throughout. There is some sort of permeability of these levels of society, strata in society. But generally, um, you know, if you're not a good artist, even if you're from a privileged class, you'll be sent to paint in the countryside, uh, propaganda posters, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and if you're good, you'll, you're the best one in the studio is Manstay Art Studio. There's other art studios that are also sort of recommended. It's a very much college gate sort of life. Um, you know, you're looked after by the, by the, by the studio. This studio has the blessing of, of had the blessing of Kim, uh, sorry, Kim Jong-il. And so it's a very privileged place to work. You were looked after. You have to produce work for the state, but you also have your own remit to, uh, sort of to go off to the countryside and paint something that you believe in. Again, it won't be abstract. It won't be anything but something that is you know pro pro patria um yeah yeah okay well let, let's go on to the next um so thing. yeah so, so if you're listening we're, we're, we're sort of two-thirds through i'm gonna I'll, I'll fly i don't know how we're doing for time no no we've um, got tons and tons and tons of questions and we've got lots of time so don't worry about it um, okay oh yeah so just official that's that was the art at the gallery that sadly um never made it through so these are five pieces five different artists and all of it, um, for the first time ever, you know, not, not it, very still pieces, sort of promoting uh, life and not, not, in, not in this sort of form of socialist realism. So moving on. Okay, so I brought this one in. I'll, I'll fly through it. it this is the, the, the sort of third documentary I made with Dan. Um, it's, it's Crossing the Line. It was shot in 2005, and it was this amazing story of Joe Dresnock. Ever since I've been to North Korea, there was this stories of these American defectors. And uh, the American government didn't know if they were alive or dead. We knew that four people had left. We didn't know where they'd gone to, if they'd left and moved on to China or gone to Russia as they actually intended. And to watch that film, it, it unravels just that story I'm going to tell you. The four defectors actually sitting in that speedboat there. Yeah, and so the two were sort of, well, in fact, at the back of the speedboat uh, is, is, is Dresnok, a mammoth man, big lad. In front of him is his nemesis, um, Jenkins, you can see by his ears. And then the other two, Absher and Parrish. So this is, this was a, this is basically a story just to show you that, you know, why do we, why do we get involved in North Korea? It's not just sort of providing information for Koreans to, to have to sort of wake up to see something new, but it's also for the sort of Western audience. And very much making a state of mind was for a Western audience to to understand a little bit more as, as uh, uh, of the access we had to, to North Korea. Just to so, fill in, those were defectors who were obviously doing um, military service with the Americans in South Korea. 
That's um, right. It's post Korean War. -Korean so, War. so um, sort of yeah, 60, 60, 62, uh, the first sort of defections with Abshur and, and Dresnok, and then sixty three. Uh, um, followed by, uh, I've got, got for his name, um, uh, blah, 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 um, Jenkins Parish. Parish, and then, and 65 Jenkins um, coming out. So this is them, this is a piece that was obviously dropped over to the, the southern side of the border to sort of say to soldiers, come over, and if you, you know, come over, it's a party here, and we also pay you for the weapon you bring. In fact, in the end, the, Nor the North Koreans did quite badly out of it. This lot were pretty illiterate. Um, Jenkins certainly had a, a, a low IQ. They, were, they, were, they weren't the sort of, you know, the, the gambit that they wanted. They weren't this sort of fantastic bag of, bag of expertise that they got. They got basically a lot of Virginian lads who weren't much, <laughs> much used to them. One of, the reason I know a lot about it, one of the, one of our guides, I, I was, we, before we made the film, I said, did you ever meet these? And he said, yeah, I met, I was one of, one was the teacher. We had to teach him English. He was so bad. He, you know, he didn't know verb conjugation. And in fact, Dresnok, you know, he grew, grew up as an orphan. His father he looked after one son, but threw him out. And he, he was a bit of a, you know, a bad lad. Um, and they, they called him submarine feet because he's, he's a big lad and his shoes were, were so big. So it, what's fun about being there so long is you, you can get a bit of background knowledge. Like I said before, you can have photograph albums, but you can also speak to Korean friends who, who will give you an understanding and you can gather that in sort of patchwork, if you like. Um, the next picture is of, of, of Jenkins and Dresnot, sort of slightly older versions. I and mean, if you go back, if you just go back the slide, you can see before and after. I always like doing that. They didn't like each other. They, yeah, they, they absolutely loathed each other. I think Joe is, a, is psychotic, was psychotic, um, he's dead now, but he, he, had, uh, he had the rule of the roost. You know, the other three were under him, but Jenkins- The guy on the right, the guy on the right. right yeah, Joe, the, the big lad. Yeah. Um, and you can actually see by their body language there, um, you know, that, that things weren't uh, particularly amiable between the two of them. That was the first meeting we had. By the second meeting, we, the North Koreans said, we don't want you to film anymore. We said, well, we've already got this. So it's up to you uh, whether you want us or not. But we, we you know, we, if you want the story told uh, objectively, as objective, you know, as, and that was based on trust. So they said, okay, we believe you to sort of tell at least you may not tell the truth, but at least you don't lie, I think was a, sort of the words they used. Um, but Jenkins went back uh, to, 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 with his wife, Hitomi Soga, at a different time, but his wife was a Japanese abductee. So uh, already these stories had started spinning and getting much more complicated. Um, here's Joe then on his own. This is outside the next picture, outside a bit of anti-US propaganda. Um, the next slide of him as an actor, he was, after teaching, um, when they found out he wasn't really much good as a teacher, he became an actor. Um, the next slide is, you know, from portrayed in, in anti-American movies. Um, they, there was a big shortage, as you can imagine, of, of, of foreigners. Um, this is actually in the War Museum. This is the diorama, an incredible artistic talent. This is a sort of tank with the, the sort of receding 360 degree rotunda you sit in and you you you're walked around the battle scene um and the next picture is joe and the next surprise was you know the actors in north korea are famous uh, joe is well known uh, dresnok um for, for his the role he played he's known by north koreans as arthur and the guy he's speaking to there is urim uh, he's a very handsome lovely sort of a smoker he's, he's also sadly died the next picture uh but he had this wonderfully gravelly voice and you're in a, a massive star of north korea film um he played the hero and he it's it's an incredible series this one was the nameless nameless heroes if you've got time on your hands and you want to watch 16 odd episodes this is the one and what was quite fun with this is, is that they actually used uh they actually used Koreans dressed up as foreigners because the, so, and there were there was a, one of the uh, the stars was a girl called Janet. I think we got a picture of her later, and she was Polish Korean. So anyone who looked slightly non-Korean, it was given a wig, and um, I'll, yeah, there's a poster coming up, and you'll see them sort of showing showing in a minute. Um, Joe, in the next picture, this is Joe in the in uh, this, on the sort of uh, 60th birthday of uh, I think it was the 60th birthday um, of 
1972, yeah, of, of Kim Il-sung's birth, the, um, they were made citizens. And this is, uh, this is a picture of Joe actually getting a, a box of gifts from no other than uh, Kim Il-sung. That's written up there on the, the top piece of uh, Korean graphics. So that was, you know, we thought, well, that's enough. We've got this story. This is amazing. Uh, the next picture is of us filming. We've got access to the DMZ. Uh, this is the crew, a very small crew, um, down in the, in the centre in the white shirt, and Nick, who we've used for all our films. And then another surprise came. Wow, you know, the next picture, suddenly this blonde-haired lad, uh, Gabriel, turned up. In, in, and in, in fact, he, he is Gabriel, but he was known to us as a different name when we were filming. I think they wanted to hide his sort of, his parents' past, his mother, um, was, was Romanian. So there's a whole, the, the, the stories that started come flooding in, but here he is sort of with college mates and, and the next picture with, you know, mates at home. Uh, he speaks fluent Korean, he speaks broken English. Uh, he is North Korean as, uh, and it's a very unusual situation as you can imagine. He, they all married, you know, they're Korean sweethearts at school and they've now got kids. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting also, have they met these protagonists? in early 2000s of knowing them now and still sort of continuing to see them um the story even got more complicated the next picture is is joe joe's first wife uh died and his second wife was toga from uh, basically uh, her, her mother dodo's mother this lady's mother was a togolese diplomat uh, was a korean uh, who who had an affair with a togolese diplomat and and they also had a child uh, Tony, who was, I think, born in 2000. So there's a whole, you know, the, the stories coming out were amazing. But the next one is not only we're getting that, we're getting access into people's lives. In, in North Korea, very rare to get into people's homes. So we were seeing life. And it was, you know, Joe wasn't living in some fancy apartment. And it was very much like the kids' apartment with film for a state of mind. And it, 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 these sort of little vignettes of life were very important to us. Um, the next picture is the radio. Um, oh, I think that might, might appear somewhere else, but there's also in every room there's a radio that you can't turn off. You can just sort of, it works by a volume control. Um, this slide here, I think you, you see quite a few foreigners. There's basically one in the main picture, there's one on the right, and there's one in the middle. The only real foreigner is Parrish, the one sort of in the middle on the bottom. Um, and, and this is sort of basically using Koreans disguised uh in all sorts of manners um moving on to the next one this was the, the man in that last picture uh parish he also died and of course when you defect you don't take your family photos with you um and so we brought back dan was in the states filming the american section and brought back pictures of the family and the next picture is of the a, a very emotional moment showing these kids pictures of their father, you know, at, at their age um, and, and younger. So very, very special, very poignant sort of moment there. And again, uh, uh, that's his wife um, uh, so from the Lebanon and who, you know, we asked him, did you, were you abducted? And she said, no, no, I came here as a tourist. And we asked her again, because we weren't totally convinced with that. And she said, no, we're a tourist. And, and that's how we worked in filming in North Korea with, with Dan. It was a, uh, He's an exceptional director and we, we would ask, we'd give people, you know, the benefit of the doubt and the audience uh, can then make their own opinion. We don't, for American TV, we tended to, the edits were much more obvious, you know, this is good and this is bad, but for the BBC, um, much more open-ended. And so the next slide. Repeat those films just so people know they are. If, you, if you're um, Dan Gordon, yeah. films, uh, The State of Mind, yeah, the game, the lives was the football one. A state of mind was the one on the gymnasts, and crossing the line was this one where we're looking at now, the one on the, the defectors. Um, and then the next slide is quite enjoyable. <laughs> These are the same lads, uh, and this is typical North Korean. The, the shortage of foreigners. So these lads have been in, in the film and they've acted as themselves, uh, you know, with, without being in mufti. And now they're playing other foreigners. So they're sort of doubling up as foreigners. So this is them with wigs and great hair, etc. So, um, but again, quite fun, you know, they're all, all now married and all, yeah, you know, I, I know them. It's the most exceptional circumstances to know foreigners outside their normal territory, if you like. Mm. Um, right, we're on the we're on the we're on the final. We, we, everybody's doing well. I hope you're all 
with us. Um, lots, lots of this, this I will also whiz through. There's, there's I, I think, sort of how many slides are there? There's about 25 slides. Um, and this is about film. So the film industry in North Korea, you know, it follows every single film in North Korea follows the trope that, uh, you know, ben, that, that if you work hard or if you're wrong and you realize, you know, your, your ways, you change your ways, you will in some way benefit the revolution. You have to benefit the revolution. Um, a couple of ideas of the excitement of the film industry in North Korea is the, is the story of a nurse. Next one slide. Fantastic. You can imagine the, the drama there. Um, this is interesting. This is, you, you see it's got English and French. It was, it's made for the non-line market. This is an early film in the sort of 70s. So it's made for places such as Vietnam and, and Africa and what have you. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and in Eastern Europe. The next one, a typical militaristic theme, story of a nurse. They're great on their titles. And uh, the third one, um, Street of Love, a slightly more modern uh, drama. Um, and they do have all the genres. They have comedy, they have not quite thrillers, but they, they have, you know, bad lads, like a marathon runner who drinks and eats too much, but realizes the error of his ways and, 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 and changes to support his country. But they all fit in with, like the art, this sort of socialist realism style. So I wanted to see, was it possible to produce a piece of work that was as apolitical as possible and was made for entertainment. And the next slide is, this goes back to this sort of story of trust. This is the, the girl that I make all my films with. Um, we go by Rion is her name. And here we are script writing. And we, you can see the size of the script. It's the sort of two big pieces just underneath that sit, sheet there. And we're going through the dialogue and uh, in a coffee shop. This is all very informal. This is no. This is this is where trust helps. This is. I came just to visit and as a as a tourist, and then I sneaked off with her to go and and sit in a coffee shop, and go through the script. And at the same time, my colleague Anya Dalemans, who's also the co, -co director, uh, is in Belgium. I'm with sort of I'm acting as the interlocutor between all of us. Um, this film they they was put up. Uh, for, for, for presentation to see if they would, you know, film it. And we were refused. They said, it's not a North Korean trope. You'll never make this film. Uh, it, it's too glib and it doesn't fit. So that was it. After two years script writing, the film was off. And the next slide shows sort of wind, uh, oh, sorry, missing it. But what happened um, is it was winter and, uh, the script was dead, absolutely dead. It's the story of a, a, a basically of a, a trapeze artist of a, a, who, who was originally a coal miner and dreams of becoming a tra trapeze artist. Um, and they said that doesn't fit the North Korean trope. And what happened, the script was over, but Ryom did the first bit of sort of, if you like, marketing. And she left the script downstairs in winter in the very, very cold office. It's even colder inside the buildings than it is outside. And people, for people to go and warm up with the, the doorman and read the script. And people sort of say, oh, I, I heard a script, can I read it? And it started gaining popularity. And, and she then tried again, went all around every single director. And again, they said no, you know, the film studio said no, even the TV studio said no. But finally, they, there was someone who knew her father. Her father had been a cinematographer. And by pure coincidence, by pure serendipity, he said, well, look, you know, your father, my father worked together, let's give it a go. And we were off. So we had permission. We had no funding. Uh, we had, you know, whatever choreographers had sort of put together. So we went in search of making this story of a of a trapeze of a girl, a coal miner, the deepest underground, to wanting to become a trapeze artist. Pretty simple story, and we had the decision there to either cast uh, an actress and sort of to have a uh, like a, a second going in and doing all the cartwheeling, or to train um, uh, an actual trapeze artist. And the next picture. Um, is, is of the trapeze artist. This is, this is, uh, this is uh, Han Jong Sim, who became Comrade Kim. And we worked with all the actors to teach her uh, how to act. Um, we move on the next slide. Um, this is the camera that we sort of got in. I'm not quite sure about the sanctions we're in at the time, but it's getting pretty close. We got a camera in and all these lovely actors and amazing people, um, we're helping them uh, sort of uh, helping these 
both the lead and the second leads were from the circus. We got them working together. I had never made a film before, but the director who decided to take this on, the only films he'd made had been war films. So all he was interested in was the girl crying, doing a weak, typical girl. And really he wanted a male hate hero, not a heroine. And the odd explosion. So I came in then as sort of doff the hat as co-director, which was really just sort of make the girl strong, and make our heroine tough. Um, we'll move on with the, the next slide on that one. And uh, this is it. This is, this is with the, the George Clooney. Here she's speaking with George Clooney of North Korea. Um, uh, he, this guy was, uh, was, was as, as a young star, was also a bit of a heartthrob. He'd slightly lost it at this time. But we were told by people when we were making the film, make sure you put some beautiful people in. We're fed up with looking at old people. Um, carrying on. The budget was pretty, this is our, the shot that you may notice if you watch the film, it's available on Vimeo. Uh, what looks like a crane shot is in fact us perched on the very top of that Yangang Hotel. So the next shot shows us preparing, planting plastic flowers. Um, and the next shot is the actual shot from, from as it looks in film, so sort of taking away the gloss. What we found with the actors in North Korea is they don't really show a lot of emotion other than you know, thanks to the leader of the revolution. So we had to fill a lot of it in with animation and there's sort of four big animation sequences. And again, that goes back to our artwork. We, we, we used the lino cuts. Um, so this is the little bus when she goes back on her, on, on her way home. And the next picture is that same scene you've just seen uh, of her in that, in that field. But the final thing was glorious. It was shot in almost a super technicolor one and hit, this is her, Comrade, Comrade Kim. Uh, there she is sort of up on her trapeze and that, that's a real shot, so it's no, no safety net. This is her sort of stripping down a, a, a piece of cloth um, at the Workers' Festival, part of the film story. Uh, next shot. And there's our girl in, her, in all her glory, um, Comrade Kim. And um, moving on. So why did we make this film? Uh, it was the first film that would, not only when we shot it, we weren't sure if it would be allowed to be seen in North Korea because it, like I say, wasn't, it was made for entertainment. And in fact, Kim Jong-il gave the stamp for it to be made. And then it needs to go to the next stage, which is Kim Jong-un giving it the stamp because it, it, this fell between the two leaders. And um, so if you just go back to the previous slide, that is, it, it actually was given permission to be shown in uh, North Korea. And this is the premiere uh, at the Pyongyang International Film Festival, Cannes of the East, of the, uh, the last Cold War country, if you like. And this is the audience in hysterics. No, I promise you that they did laugh. Um, the, next, the next shot uh, is the film actually became fairly iconic. This is at the, on the International Cinema House and this poster on the far right is, is of our girl. And I think it's, there should be a blow up of that. There she is. Um, and it was also sort of turned in the next shot is I, I think the DVD. So it was available throughout the whole of North Korea, which was quite remarkable in itself. But then we were invited to the next shot is of it at um, Busan. And this is myself and Anya Dalman's the the co-director with me. And that was quite terrifying. This was the first time that a film, a North Korean film had been shown to a public audience in, 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 in South Korea. Uh, this is the biggest film, one of the biggest, or the biggest film festival in Asia, if not one of the, the major film festivals in the world. And we were sat in this, this is you know, not even the full screen. It's a massive screen and a massive audience. And we were waiting for this, you know, these questions to come in. How dare you do this, et cetera, et cetera. And it, this, the first question came and this, this man stood up and he said, he said, it's nice to see that in the North, mother-in-laws are just as bad as they are in the South. And from then on, it was just a delight. And this film is now, you know, shown uh, sort of over 10 film festivals in South Korea. So we, we did what we set out to do. Uh, I, I, we ended up, um, there's just a couple more slides left. Uh, we ended up taking the, the actress and, and Ryom, the, the woman I was writing the script with, that's the two of them there. That's Han Jong Sim in pink and Ryom Mihua in the green. Uh, this is Udine. Um, and this is them sort of receiving accolades from a, a massive, it's a beautiful place, it's an opera house that they, they open up as a, as a, a cinema house for the festival. Um, she was saved, Han Jung Sim didn't really like Italian food, but because it was an Asian film festival, there was actually a bit of tenjang, a bit of um, red chili paste that she could 
decorate spread liberally on her spaghetti so she was saved and then the last picture is of my erstwhile colleague simon who i've really achieved everything with um as well as with josh simon has been with me uh we work together uh, but basically he does the travel and helps me sort of with the cultural projects and this is him uh three years ago running into han jong sim on the street she she had been um single until the film was made because she's a trapeze artist she's got no time to see people she's a uh, 30 meters up in the air but uh, after the film had been a success someone walked around to the back of the cinema and said i've seen you on film you are very beautiful can i walk you home and a year later the first baby was born so if anyone asks me you know is it his engagement do something it's it's at the very least it's uh, brought a, a, a young trapeze artist into the world and that, I think, is, is that. Um, so we can open the field up for questions. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with this sort of rather long dribble. <laughs> no, it's good. We've got a huge number of questions here. All right. And um, I will ask um, Isabel to, to open the microphones on a, on, on a few in a, in a second. Um, but the, the thing, I think partly, the question I'm going to put to you, Nick, first is, and I think you've answered this in, in, um, in the way you've talked about your various um, exchanges and the impact you've had. And um, how do you justify traveling in North Korea? Why, why should, this is, this is a totalitarian state. People mm. are not free. Um, their lives are in, so much poorer than most people in the, in the surrounding region. Um, and, and you are really just giving money to the regime. Yeah, I mean, I'm fine. I think if you have that view, you have that view and you, and you won't travel to North Korea. And uh, I, I, I respect that. I think for the work that we've, <clears throat> the work that we've, <clears throat> this is good, this is a, <clears throat> that's obviously some deep psychological thing that you shouldn't travel. Um, for our work, uh, I think over since 93, I feel that we're just the projects we've done through tourism alone uh, sort of indicate our approach. I think you, you have to take two, two views, you know, do you engage with the country or do you not? And part of that engagement is, is through people being exposed to others. And so that's the sort of the benefit, I think, of tourism. I mean, we've, we've put through our sort of 40 odd thousand people to that country. And a North Korean friend of mine who was who I have very special access said to me, what my country needs is people awoken. If you think people are going to awake, uh, and this is very much like in China, don't forget, I've, been, I've seen sort of China to go through a sort of similar process. The amount of engagement we were doing in China uh, definitely had an impact. I, I, it's, it's, a, it's very easy to quantify, um, let's do nothing uh, by simply doing nothing. To, to quantify, is it valuable engagement? I don't know. But my personal experience of seeing China change through the massive engagement that we had, through the embassies, through the cultural projects, um, had a definite impact in waking people, in exposing people. Now, okay, it may have gone awry since then, but in North Korea, there's been absolutely nothing. It would be impossible to say that we need less engagement. There is virtually nothing going on. In, in fact, and I'm not, not trying to crow, but the British Embassy said, you know, you do more than we do we, we, because we've got freer reign. So, from an individual point of view, for example, one person I know, one girl, uh, became a guide because her father had been exposed, you know, but met me on a hill somewhere and had said a couple of words in English. And, and she was so impressed, she learned English, she wanted to become a guide. She then later, subsequent to that, spoke to her father and said, wow, you know, because you learn English, I learned English. She said, I his father said, I only speak two words. But it's this idea that she was exposed to something else. It hasn't changed her life in a way that she's got a different career but she's, she's, she's more open. Um, and I think that is definitely a way ahead. If you think that by enclosing a country, by turning it off, since I've been going, since 93, it has improved the situation, I would say no. I, I don't, and also this, this argument about money, I mean, it, it, it's, it's possible with Chinese tourists, there's large numbers, so over 200,000 Chinese tourists. With Western tourists, certainly not. There's not enough num num numbers of tourists. We take half the tourists to the country to run an office. Um, so yes, it is part of this, but, but you have to sort of, it's that sort of one step back, two steps forward argument. I would go for that. 
Uh, Isabel, if you could, um, I think Ron Gluckman's got a question, if you could bring Ron Gluckman's... Um... Ron Gluckman travelled with us, he's a, an amazing journalist. Right. He okay. travelled with us a couple of times, and uh, this is the first time I've communicated him with a long, long time. Yeah, while, while Ron's waiting for his microphone to be turned on, which I think is almost on, um, I'll talk just very briefly about visiting the um, British um, office or British... Um, was it an embassy? I think it was an embassy in... in Consul, I suppose. Yeah. Um, it is an embassy now. I think, yeah, you, it will have been the embassy then, yeah. Yes, yeah, maybe it wasn't... Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it was, I can't remember its, its official status, but going to visit them and having been all around the country, them talking to us with a lot of envy, uh, we certainly got to see, I think, a, a lot more than most of the diplomats do. And um, I've, from travelling there four times, I, I think we've got a great insight uh, into North Korea, and I'll also mention Rudiger Frank, who travelled with us on each mm -hmm. of those occasions. Who's a professor of economics in the University of Vienna, and he was he was able to give us a real, a very good explanation of, of what was going on. Yeah, when you're there. You go ask your question. Um, I am here, but um, d just for the record, I never travelled with Nick or Korea in North Thanks, Korea. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> I just bowled with him there. Yeah. That's um, yeah. The question was, um, you, you mentioned uh, being there, uh, the question of trust. You said it's like walking a tightrope and that you, you aren't really building trust. You're more trying to see what you can get away with. I think that's what you said. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious a uh, couple times where you pushed too far and, and things went wrong. Because my experience in North Korea, sometimes it was always a mystery what I had done. You know, yeah. you know, you crossed the line, but you don't know why. Yeah, I, I think that comes with, I mean, on all sorts of fronts. I mean, there are all sorts of examples I can give. I mean, the, the it could be as basic as a, going with a photographer or filming something and cropping the leader's image. I mean, there is no excuse for anything. If you do anything against the leaders, that's it. So that can be as simple as you know, even cutting off a slogan. And, and we all know the horrendous story of Otto Warmbier and what have you. You know, there is, there is no excuse when it comes to the leader, etc. So we are particularly careful. And the, the, longer, the more experience we, experience we have, um, the sort of slightly safer you get, but perhaps the more confidence you get. So you have to remain totally careful at all times. And, and that is a conversation you need to have with your, your Korean counterpart. Because once it gets out, once something goes further along the line. I, there's one incident, for example, I met a, a, a Korean friend who I, I do um, other projects with, and I met him outside a hotel, and, and we went to have a beer and a game of pool. He was reported because I was on a different visa and immediately taken into question, why did you meet this chap? And I happened to be at a hotel I never normally stay with. So it all, if you actually look at it from afar, this looks like an absolute, you know, they've organized to meet secretly. So suddenly it goes from a very innocent meeting that by pure chance meeting someone on the street to a very serious, you know, what were you doing? Why, why, why did you meet him? What are you discussing? So yeah, you, but these things you learn. So now if I meet someone else, I just walk past them and maybe you know, tip my head, but that's it. Um, other, other little instance, and we, we make sure that we brief our tourists. We have an hour's briefing, an hour and a half's briefing with them before we go in. But people will react strangely. And North Koreans, once you get there, will sort of make you feel, oh, it's normal. And you start relaxing and you start making mistakes. Um, there's all sorts of inc incidences. I mean, there's one chap who left the, left the country with a, with, a, with, a, with a bit of soil. Now, people, you know, pick up objects. Well, that's fine. But, you know, he picked up a stone, a little bit odd. And it was found at customs. He says, why have you picked this up? And the guy, I'm sure, was actually taking it back to, it was from a part of the country. Uh, that you know, just a, for maybe a South Korean neighbor or something. The fact that the Artur had also visited Yongbyon sort of around the nuclear complex suddenly turned that into a very different story and only needed one North Korean to say, ah, oh, look, they've been here, for the other nine not to go, oh, yeah, well, oh, that's just ridiculous, it's just a stone, but to say, hmm, you've got a point. So, yeah, everything is fraught with problems. I, I've, I've got lists of getting away with it. We, we have, thank goodness, not put any Korean colleagues into difficulty, as far as I know. And all our protagonists who we work with in film or art, you know, are still there and I still meet them. I mean, this is the, you know, and I know they're, I've known them before they were married. I've, you know, met them when they were, you know, before, and now they're with kids and things. So 
I've got a fair idea. But the more people that go in, the more risk there is because they are not opening up. They don't want to open up. The people might want to open up, but the system has to remain watertight. They do want engagement, but they don't want engagement that will create change. It's a sort of what it's like. It's like Deng Xiaoping. You know, if you wind down the window, flies get in. But North Korea actually also has a as a sort of fly screen. So that's what we're up against. Um, we've got more questions. Um, I know um, Jim Lowenstein uh, had a good one. Can we get J Jim's microphone up? And then we've got one also from Valeria Stella Papis. Have we got able to get Jim? Are you um, are you there? Your microphone should be coming on very shortly. If Jim's microphone's not on, I will ask his question for him. I tell you, I'll ask Jim's question and then maybe Jim can follow up. So the question was, um, do, do North Koreans learn foreign languages at school? Yeah, this is, what's amazing is that they, um, from a young age, they'll, they'll learn basic Chinese. So they'll, they'll have sort of 2000 odd characters, sort of, um, so they've got a basic Chinese. And in fact, if you look in, in South Korean, um, you know, they still use, a few Chinese characters. Um, then North Korea, not at all, but Chinese just because it is the neighbor. But the, the, the first language you will learn is English, and that's throughout. Um, if you want to do Chinese or Russian, um, you will then go on to do that at college or at university. So English is, 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 is kids have a sort of a, a very poor approach to it. But what's interesting is recently, in the, well, certainly in the last five years, you get more and more kids coming up to you and saying, you know, hello, or listening in on a conversation, um, trying to get the basics. But again, you know, unless there's a practical application for using that language, it was like me learning French. You know, what was the point? Uh, I, until I went to France and then I suddenly realized, oh yes, actually this is useful. These kids don't, don't leave. So, okay, it might be useful for the, there's not even a game pack you're gonna open that's gonna have English instructions. It's all either going to be, you know, then things can maybe have Chinese or what have you. So one of the things that we do encourage, again, with tourism is, is a form of engagement of people going around speaking. And, and don't forget that in China, you know, speakers' corners were, you know, massively important to people to generate that, that infusion, that interest. But it, we're not even at that stage in North Korea. We, we are at a stage where people, they used to shout spasiba to you because you know they thought we were the sort of the, the, the Russian lads coming in now they do say hello and if you grab a student and embarrass them they will start speaking um so English is is a, is a very key key language there so on I've on um trips to Pyongyang I've been to the um the as a grand people's library and what's the yeah, grand people's study house yeah the study house and I've taken part in English classes there and um, been to the library where you can get tapes out to learn English. And I found uh, Johnny Cash, um, uh, a boy named Sue, being people learning the lyrics um, to that, which I thought was hilarious. And um, Dolly Parton, nine to five. Um, yeah. So some, uh, obviously the, 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 the elite to learning English and they're learning computer science and a whole range of things. Jim, is that, uh, Jim, can you hear? You, um, yes. but this, I mean, the elite is Pyongyang. I mean, this is not, yeah. don't forget that, that Pyongyang is the elite, it, it, and that is, yeah, so you're, you're off for a good chance in life if you're born in Pyongyang. It's difficult to make in Rosehill Square. Jim, have you got a follow up to that? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, the second part of the question is Does Kim Jong il speak a foreign language? I mean, he spent several years being educated in Switzerland. Uh, one thing that I've seen said that he was at an English school in Switzerland. Anyway, do we know? Kim yeah, the, um, the, the, we can go on forever here, but I, well, what's interesting is the, I, I haven't met the leader, and I'm uh, probably quite grateful for that. A chap who has is currently in prison, uh, Michael Spavor in China, and an amazing uh, young lad. And it's so sad that uh, anyway, that situation, that's, I think you can, you can find that information on that yourself. Um, the leader, I think, has a sort of rudimentary sort of English, perhaps, but he will speak, uh, as you would find in China, even if he spoke fluent English, they would speak in their language, so they wouldn't be misunderstood. It's the same in, in, in China. If, if you meet someone there who's head, up, you know, head, 
he will have a translator. It's sort of all part of that hierarchical nonsense. I don't know, and there are better people to ask. And in fact, one of the big sources to ask, and, and I'm sure someone's going to ask, you know, what, where is where is the leader? Where is Kim Jong-un at the moment? NK News uh, is an amazing sort of uh, uh, sort of news source set up by an Englishman, Chad O'Carroll, and with a great team of, of journalists and reporters. If you want to know anything sort of fact-based as opposed to Fox News-based, uh, then I would recommend NK News. We've got about another 15 minutes to go. Um, well, no. <laughs> people, people will be walking yeah, out there. Right nowhere near answering all these questions. <laughs> um, Valeria, can, you've, got, you've got quite a few questions there. Do you want to ask one or two of them? Because I think you've got several. Well, hello. Hi. Hello. Well, I have a couple of questions, very different. One was uh, related to the previous one. Like, uh, I know that the leader studied in Switzerland, and I know there is a large Northern Korean community there. Do they support or spread Northern Korean art in Europe somehow, the Switzerland community? Yeah, I don't know about the Switzerland community. I mean, Koreans, the, the, the biggest diaspora sort of are in Japan and, and they're split into mainly Koreans who support South Korea, but there's also a, a, a group of Koreans there who support the North Korean uh, system. So that's already split. And the, the next big bunch will be in, in sort of America and Los Angeles. And, and yeah, and throughout the, 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 the various countries, England sort of, there are also uh, um, Koreans going around. I don't know what they support. I don't know what they do. I think they'd be very careful uh, to do anything that was seen as uh, propaganda for 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 um, the regime. They, I don't. I don't know if they are supporting North Korea. The only people there will be from the embassy, and of course they will be very pro um, promoting arts and what have you. In, in the um, speaking from my personal experience, the the North Korean embassy in, in Britain, that has put on art exhibitions of, of North Korean art, etc. I don't think it's been that successful. I, I think without, there's, there's no understanding of North Korean history of art, so there's no really no place for it to fit in. If you think recently Chinese art, probably all you know about it is the contemporary stuff, uh, not the history, you know, and then the ancient history. So until that's put in, um, there's no real market for it. But I think anyone looking at it, Sort of trying to answer that question, but I think anyone looking at North Korean art, there's any film we've made or any piece of North Korean art we put out, we've never had anyone saying, oh, I want to defect. Uh, I think most people put it on the wall, you know, for decoration and, and, and that'd be it. I think it's rather anodyne the way that they've turned propaganda, you know, for the Cultural Revolution, the, the horrendous period, you know, that we shoved that on our wall. Um, it's sort of it's sort of been, the power has been taken away from it all. Yeah. So it's seen just as sort of decoration. Right, we've got some quite specific questions coming up from Raphael Munudier. Um, and um, we've got another one from Victoria Barclay. Um, and then there's also um, Martin Johnson. So if you can get any of those, those names up, Raphael Munudier um, or Victoria Barclay, I don't know if Isabel can see those. We won't be able to possibly get, get all of these ones in, so I might, while we're waiting, um, I'll ask Martin Johnson's question, which is, do you foresee future art projects with artists from DPRK to open up the art to a wider world as being possible? And obviously this is something you've been working on, but the current context is very, very difficult, isn't it? Yeah, I, 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 the art projects I do, we, we have a studio, we have a thing called Corey Studio where we sell art, and I mean, it's small and it, it, it's fun, but it is, I hope, the beginning of producing some art that makes artists think. Uh, so I'm not interested in, uh, you know, I've got to be, I've got a collection of art. I don't, I don't, I'm not selling that. And I, I don't want to sell North Korean art. They produce volumes of it. I'm not really interested in that. My, my thing is the process. So I'm, um, I think North Koreans will be very keen on selling their art and making money. And then that comes into a rather different category, you know, do you believe in supporting that? It's not something that, that interests me. And there are people who've bought, there was a, a chap, uh, it's a, a collection who, um, who paid like 500,000, I think, euros, well, that's what I was told, for a massive collection of art. I mean, he's very welcome to it. It's, it's sort of crap. Um, I think there's, you know, there's good art and bad art, but, but the socialist realism has its, has its place. And, I, my thing is trying to work with artists and, and pushing that envelope, if you like. So don't know, don't care. 
Ra Raphael, you've got a question there. We've got a few questions there. Yeah, do, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Raphael, yeah. Yeah, hello. I, I just had a question about the two books that you published about North Korean art. And uh, it's more about like, is there, was there any copyright issue when you were preparing the book? Like, did you have any discussion with North Korean official about what you were going to publish? Or did it just allow, allow any publication about North Korean art? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that question. Can I, I'd like to do one of those, a sort of politician's thing. Sorry, I didn't quite get, um, uh, it's a little bit on the never, never. I actually work with the industrial design studio on a project where we're currently doing um, new, new works with them. So it's, uh, the, the, I mean, the real answer is no, um, but with an understanding from individuals, what we're up to. So the, the liner cuts, you know, they're all in my collection. And as you know, if you buy a piece of art, if, if I buy a piece of art made by Raphael Monidier, uh, the art is mine, but not the copyright. So I would not be legally allowed to sort of print that work off. Um, so uh, I, I did. Uh, I, I have printed it off and I don't hold a copyright for it. But we did as, make as many sort of uh, efforts with the North Korean authorities as possible. But uh, as a stamp piece of paper, no. Thanks, Raphael, for that. Good question. Yeah, we've got some really good questions coming up. One from Kate Oldfield, Isabel, if you, if you can see that. And then another one from David Taylor. Um, so if we could, um, uh, Isabel has to um, find the, um, the microphone and, get, and um, turn one of those on. But if Kate or, or um, David, Ta David Taylor or Kate Oldfield are available. Hi. Right? <clears throat> Hello, Kate. Hello, Hi. Kate. Um, I just wondered if you could um, tell us a bit more about women in North Korea. Nick, you are a friend of mine and we've talked about this before, but it's very interesting that you say that a lot of the imagery shows uh, an equality of men and women, but actually it's still a male-led society. So two questions. Um, what are the visible differences to the European's eye? And also what happens about childcare in North Korea? Yeah, the, the, uh, thanks, Kate. The, the role of a woman, you know, is, is portrayed in literature and, and even, you know, the saying they have is that women turn, you know, half the cartwheel in North Korea. So, yeah, they're betrayed as equality. And it, it would be a fascinating, a, a fascinating study um, to, to look actually at the reality. The, the women I know who've made it, who've gone to places, are very tough individual characters. And of, of the two who would spring to mind, one is Romy Wa, our producer. Um, who's one vastly talented and uh, once she's accepted something she will pursue it to the to the end um, so she's got there simply by drive but also you know using all her wiles uh, to get to keep in position and to keep in a position where um, to keep everyone else out if you like so this is you know I will take you I will lead this you, you, she won't introduce you to other people around herself she wants she's got you we will work together on projects and and i admire her for that the other woman who i know quite well is is from a a, a cooperative farm and she's in charge simply because she's just so ready good at her job and men respect her out of that out of that very reason so women you know there is there is a potential um but definitely the the sort of there are ages for example a woman is meant to get married at 27 and have kids and you know they say girls I have a lot of guides who they are 27 and that's when sort of marriage starts uh, if they're not married by then their parents will start um, sort of doing a little bit of matchmaking etc so as a woman you are expected to get to be married but for example our editor uh, in, in um, the film Comrade Kim Goes Flying she's the only single woman I know uh, she's called Edith simply because a friend of mine met her and they, she said editor and he said oh Edith um, and she an amazing girl but uh, very unusual uh, in society she you know to do her job and to be in that she's had to sort of forgo getting married and going through that whole process or she would not be in that position there are no female film directors so if that gives you an idea of how far we are away um, regards care, it's very much like the China system. It's sort of uh, the, the parents are used. So if, if you're a young mum, basically the child will be brought up. You'll be brought up in your, in your um, likely your husband's uh, parents' house, unless you're lucky enough to get your own space. 
but the uh, eldest, uh, the sort of the first son will be looking after the parents and uh, your, your life will, yeah, you'll go to work and you'll, you'll come back and the kids will be looked after, you know, your parents. It, it is also possible that you, you can, um, you know, just retire, you'll just be a, a housewife. Uh, that also happens uh, if you're lucky enough to live in Pyongyang. But if you're in the countryside, yeah, it's a full-on day and your parents looked after by your, by your grandparents. Uh, David, David Taylor, another really good question here. I think this is a, a question which is a really fundamental one to a society in North Korea at the moment. David. Hello, Nick. We've known each other for quite some time. <laughs> um, it's been a great show. Uh, my question is on entrepreneurship. Um, to what extent is there entrepreneurship within, uh, within North Korea? Uh, and to what extent is that sort of necessity entrepreneurship or indeed people who are aspirationally wanting to run their own businesses and earn their own money? There's, um, I, there's basically, there's a group, there's a, there's a wonderful group run by a, a Singaporean and, and a friend of mine, Andre, who's been doing literally specifically um, uh, in, 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 in entrepreneurship. I'll, I'll send actually the link to them because they are an amazing group of people who send out experts to, to set up entrepreneurship projects in North Korea, whether it be, uh, you know, setting up sort of how to set seed funding up etc um i will put the link on so perhaps if nick can share that later on but there are people uh you know going out um uh, with with that that specific purpose of uh, because now again since 2002 and, and and again 2012 big economic changes you know money is king for the first time ever it's not producing before 2002 it was can we produce you know over quota with our plastic bottles, uh, the, the plastic necessities disabled complex factory used to make a lot of buckets and they would be rewarded because they exceeded their quotas. From sort of 2001 onwards, it suddenly became money became important. And the idea of bringing in foreign investment by bringing in money uh, became the most important. So that's been a massive change. And with that, uh, you know, entrepreneurship has flourished. Of course, this has all gone to ground to a massive halt since sanctions and whether you believe in sanctions or not i my feeling for north korea is it's it's affected this growth of an entrepreneurship class of an entrepreneurial class and i think that's very sad mm. there is a significant trade that goes along that border with um, china it's still um, quite porous and uh, later mm. on in the next um, four to six weeks we will be coming back looking at north korea um, and we've got a lot of people who can, who can talk to you a bit more about that in terms of the trade that does exist, the kind of businesses that are set up, the unofficial businesses, the black market. So we'll definitely, as a subject, we'll be definitely coming back to. Um, we've got about another sort of two, two minutes to go. So I'm going to ask um, Victoria Barclay's question for her, which is, are you, do you take your, the film out of North, North Korea? Do you edit it there? Do you edit it outside? Yeah, no, good question. Yeah, for the, for the, when we, when we, the first film we made, A State of Mind, um, it was probably the second documentary, or the first sort of full-on documentary stuff. Before that was a Polish film. Um, but our first film, we, we just took out, for, for, as simple as that. By, it was the one on the game of their lives, and the Koreans saw what was happening. The second film, uh, we also took out and edited, and the first time the North Koreans saw it, was was you know when it when it was out and when it had been broadcast for crossing the line it was different we were actually told you know halfway through that we, we you know we want you to stop filming as i sort of explained and then we want to look at your footage and and we came to sort of a bit of an impasse and i said to them if if you look at our footage and tell us you know there's something that you point out the fact, things that are wrong uh, in it and explain why we will take that into consideration if you to ask us to, to delete anything, then uh, I will say we've been censored. And they said, okay, well, all right, we'll show you the points that were, were problematic. And in fact, they were very simple. One, one was simply just the, the way something was addressed and they asked if they could do the interview again. So it was delivered in a more formal tone. Um, and one was, it was a sh you're shooting a sort of dark scenes, showing unlit places, but we just left that and said, it's not really worth the bother, we kept it in. Um, but now it's much more strict. Um, because I think they've been abused. You know, there've been there have been film companies going in there with one purpose and coming out with another, um, and so they've got sort of I suppose they've got wise to sort of you know Western filmmaking. 
Um, we, were, we were never, I, I remember with a state of mind, just interesting, that Dan and I, we, were, we, we started filming the, the girl, they, they selected this dancer, who the sort of performer, um, gymnast, because she was the best gymnast. And then they said, okay, then we got access to this sort of her family who were sort of working class. And they said, oh, we, 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 when we went to film the second time, they said, oh, she's, she's not well, the grandfather's not well, sorry. Um, you can't film that family now. And we've got you a, another family. And of course, this was the family with the physics teacher, et cetera. And, and we said, no, no, that, you can't do that. And the argument then became, so we, what, we, we, rather than saying blunt no, we said, okay, we'll film both. And that's what they allowed us. So that was incredible. And it's, it's a way with DPRK, with North Korea, I think my final one, you know, you come up against a wall and you, you or us as a interlocutors have to find a way around it because the Koreans can't do that for you, but you can help get around. And it's amazing what you can achieve. There is a final question coming here from William Brougham. I uh, don't know if I pronounced his name um, correctly, but he asks, um, the posters, the North Korean propaganda posters that you can buy um, in China and some places in China, are they, are they from North Korea? Where are they made? I mean, perhaps you can tell your own story, Nick. Yeah, I, the, the posters, I mean, we, we sell uh, at the, the studio, on the studio website, they're made in North Korea, painted in North Korea. They are copies. They're never going to be worth, you know, fortunes. They're more, again, for decorative interest. Um, the real value of, you know, would be to have the original maquette. I've got some of those, the first time it was painted, or a printed one of that, because they're very difficult to get hold of. The hand-painted ones that are sold by us and by other places are painted in North Korea and they're copy versions. But again, that's how North Korea does put a lot of it on billboards. They'll paint gigantic sort of posters. So it's not, uh, it, is, it is sort of genuine, but it is made for foreign sales and there's very few of them the chinese i don't think have ever got around to to sort of seeing enough of a market or money to copy them themselves so if you see them in china it's more likely to be uh, north korean artists who are out doing on projects um in china and that does happen so that's the only other artwork i've seen is um commissions from north korean artists who are in china working on other projects and this is sort of a bit of pocket money for them well, there, I'm afraid we must leave it. It's been a fantastic talk. Um, we tried you. to answer as many questions as possible. It's been a real pleasure, Nick. Thank you very, very much. Uh, on Thursday at one o'clock um, BST, we'll be having another talk. Um, we'll be looking at the great global meltdown, looking at the impact of, uh, of COVID-19, the coronavirus, on, on our economies and what the political repercussions of that may, may be. So please do join us again at uh, 1 p.m. British Summer Time on Thursday um, and, and we'll see you all then. Thank you very much again, Nick. Goodbye. Thank you.